Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Loreen. Um, I was thinking that I would be introducing Taz, but he has turned his back on us. He's not interested today. So today is the last week of the Newberry Challenge, week four. Um, I think I'm going to have to reassess it because not too many people joined in. In fact, zero, but that's okay. I really had a great time doing it. And I know that uh, there are other people who are preoccupied with um, Pride Month, and this is also in Canada, uh, Indigenous Month. So uh, yeah, that's right, Indigenous Month. And um, it's also at the end of the school year, and it's also just summer. So I think the Newberry Awards, I give, think, are given out much earlier in the year. So I'm going to probably back this up and maybe the way do it the way other people do it for the Booker or the Giller, where you read the long list and then predict and make the short list. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Um, do a bit more research and I believe there's somebody out there from a few years ago who's already done some Newberry challenge stuff so go over their uh, videos and just see um, get some ideas yeah anyway I love reading the Newberries and one of the things that I would say to sum up the whole project is my biggest surprise is how well these books have held out so we are reading books that are 20 years old and or more and um, all but one I have really, really liked. And um, then when I look back and check to see what I have read, because I've read pretty much everything uh, for the year of 2000, which I'm talking of 2005, which I'm talking about this year, um, Kira Kira, which I have just read and will speak about in a second. Um, Al Capone Does My Shirts by G. Choldenko. Um, I liked it. I wasn't blown away by it. I would have, I think at the time, I probably would have been surprised that it was a Newberry. Uh, it's a, it kind of is what it says. Uh, Al Capone is in prison on, um, oh my gosh, that big island off of, off of California. As soon as I started to tell the story, I lost the name of the island, but it's that big, terrible prison. And um, he's in the laundry as part of what he does while he's at prison. And so the, the warden of the prison and um, all the guards and so on, there are facilities for their families to be alongside. So this young boy is um, experiencing Al Capone washing his shirts. <laughs> and they pass uh, notes back and forth. And I don't think there's any kind of an escape going on. He's got a sister who's uh, not declared autistic, but reading it from my perspective, you know, backwards, uh, pretty clear that she's got some kind of um, probably autism, something along those kinds of spectrums. And anyhow, um, yeah, I don't remember entirely what the plot is, but it was okay. That's why I'm thinking, oh, why did that win? I don't remember the plot. Okay, The Voice That Challenged a Nation, I have right here to talk about. And the other one, Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster Boy by G.D. Schmidt. Oh, I thought that one was pretty darn terrific. We've got a young girl called Lizzie Bright who's living on an island outside of, on the main coast somewhere. And the local townspeople have decided this would make a perfect resort. And so uh, Lizzie is black and the town is predominantly white. In fact, I think all the black people live on that island. So they've got um, the means to take the black families off of the island and who cares what happens to them and then turn it into a tourist situation. And um, Buckminster uh, is the son of a minister and he's trying to get his father's uh, his father was sort of an activist, I guess, but when he, come, you know, push comes to shove, instead of standing up against the townspeople and saying these people have a right to live on these islands, what are you doing, back away, uh, dad does not do what Buckminster would like. So there's just a lot of, it, it's, I don't believe there's a happy ending. I think there's even the threat of having Lizzie removed to a mental institution, which uh, was possible. You could have, if you didn't like what somebody who was black was doing, you could declare them um, insane by, or something like that and have them incarcerated in an insane asylum. So uh, it was a very interesting book and I 
think I would have put that ahead of Al Capone. But anyways, I keep saying I don't want to talk about that particular thread, but I do, I keep doing it. Kira Kira by Cynthia Kodahata is just a lovely, lovely book. She uh, is speaking about a young girl who is um, Katie and her sister, Lynn. Lynn is a few years older, like three or four years older. Katie is around 11, 12 when the story takes place. And this story is in the 1950s. And this is a Japanese family whose business has not gone well in Idaho. Not enough Japanese people to be interested in their Japanese grocery store. So they moved down to, oh my gosh, is it Missouri? One of those Southern states, South Georgia. Yikes. Um, they are ostracized for being Japanese. There is a Japanese community there. Everybody works in the chicken plant that were uh, owned by um, Mr. Linden. I do not know if it was the Linden of the presidential family. We don't get that little piece of information, but I wondered. Um, there is mostly plants owned by Mr. Linden, and then there are a few who are owned by other people, and this is taking place during the time when uh, unions are starting to make headway into some of these scenarios. Uh, Mum and Dad, who are really struggling to keep jobs and save money because they want a house, more than anything, they feel that a house would be the solution to all their ills, um, and their ills are kind of many. Uh, anyhow, they're saving like mad. They're working like mad. They're barely home. The two girls are effectively raising themselves. There's one or two older ladies in the Japanese community who kind of oversee this clutter of children who are from newborn to um, early teens. And uh, Lynn has, over the course of the story, it looks like she's got a lymphoma of some sort and is becoming progressively more ill. And so the parents' efforts to get a house before Lynn dies, and they're hoping that somehow her health will improve with this house. And so they're paying the medical bills and trying to, they end up getting a loan, which they really don't want to do. So now they're struggling to pay medical bills and mortgages. And into all of this is Katie. And Katie is crying, tying, sorry, trying to come to terms with mom and dad not being there. Uh, what it's like to be a Japanese young girl in the midst of not outright hostility, but certainly a complete lack of friendliness. Lynn is struggling um, to be healthy. Nobody's telling Katie what's going on, and uh, she can see that her sister is getting progressively um, sicker and sicker. And Katie has got a fairly high moral standard as well as a, just a beautiful, beautiful interpretation of the world around her. She's, the world is always glittering. Um, her sister Lynn has actually been very good at, um, uh, what would you say, opening up the world for Katie, like not just helping her with the homework, but looking beyond, watching the clouds, looking at the way this the uh, water glitters on leaves and, um, the slow trail of a caterpillar, for instance. And there's, so there's, Lynn is extremely poetic and observant, but as she becomes um, more in poor health, then her observational skills start to fail. And Katie helps to um, paint the world for Lynn. But, you know, is there a plot? There's, there's kind of a plot. I, I, I think those are the sort of main driving forces in the story. Um, Katie is trying to uh, not get into trouble, but she always seems to just choose the wrong thing to say. She gets mad once or twice and eventually hits someone and she tells a lie. Um, but I guess it's a book about hope, really. Yeah, I would say that's one of the, the, um, the things that are said in the little blurb on the front. It's the persistence of love and hope. And that's really, yeah, I think that's what it's about. The trying to keep itself together in the face of impending loss. And then afterwards, what happens afterwards when the child is gone and the family also has some struggles with dealing with grief and so on. I really love this book. It's definitely a beautiful middle grade book. It's so lovely in the way it's written and the characters are all really well done. And I felt sad for the parents. I felt sad for the Japanese community. It was just very good at evoking an emotion, but not um, 
it wasn't pulling on the pathetic strings. It wasn't pulling on your emotional, um, you know, commercial, the things, you know, when you see a commercial where it's about love and puppies or something, it didn't do that sort of thing. The second book that I had not read, read that I'm bringing to you is The Voice That Challenged a Nation, Marian Anderson and the Struggle for Equal Rights. So this is taking place during the time of um, Eleanor Roosevelt's. <laughs> I always think of Eleanor Roosevelt more so than her husband, President uh, uh, Roosevelt. It's like he was just, to me, he was the lesser of the two. Eleanor Roosevelt just did so much and she was such an amazing uh, female as well as making use, very clever use of her position as first lady. So um, I, I always think that Eleanor was the president. <laughs> Anyhow, um, Marian Anderson was an incredible singer. She's black and I'll, while I'm talking I'll see if I can get a good portrait picture of her. She's a, a young girl who really was singing mostly in the church but then somewhere along the way someone made a comment to her, oh, you just have such a beautiful voice. Have you ever thought of performing outside of the church? And no, she hadn't. And so they managed to get uh, some beautiful music lessons organized for her and the church rallies round and she manages to win a competition, but she's not, well, actually she loses the competition and it, it drives her forward to do better and uh, compete against. And she, she's traveling this, the deep South where she is singing course there's segregation um, and the book talks about the different segregations and what she's encountering in terms of um, hotels. She's expected to sing in the uh, hotel or sing for the people who are staying at the hotel in a different concert hall but then has to go to the blacks only hotel. Similar story for restaurants. And so uh, it's just very well done uh, story of taking or biography of Marion taking us from her young years to her final years. When she retired from singing, she was an advocate for young singers and used some of her prize money towards uh, making scholarships for young singers. And okay, I'm gonna hold this up. This is a um, photograph of Eleanor Roosevelt presenting Marion Anderson with the NAACP's Spring Arm Medal in 1939. So one of the things that Marion was able to do um, in her in her journey as an activist was insist after after she had a certain amount of fame, she was able to insist that she would not sing segregated audiences. So whatever, at a certain point, she was able to navigate that all the blacks sat on one side and all the whites sat on the other, and then she was um, popular enough that she was able to say, "Hey, integrate the audience, or I don't come." She also had a fascinating um, couple of trips over to Europe where things are just that much different. And in those um, European tours, she was able to sing all the major opera houses and concert halls. She had uh, an incredible pianist accompany her. He was German. She had a couple of pianists and one of them was a Jewish German fellow and the other one I think was German but I wasn't paying a lot of attention to the pianist story, so don't quote me. Anyhow, he traveled with her and that was also a source of problems because, you know, what's this white man doing traveling with this black lady in the deep south? They also, of course, traveled through north, um, north of USA, the, the coastlines, New York and Chicago and anything that was um, paying, basically. She had an incredible itinerary I don't I don't know how she kept it up because also when you think about it this is all the travel is taking place in cars and buses the planes not really much of an option if she was traveling by train she was in the um, blacks only section so <laughs> not comfortable not comfortable but she just had this incredible work load work ethic and as time went by and her power grew and her influence grew she was able to really open doors for other performance performers and at a certain point uh, she didn't have any children of her own but one of her nephews became oh I don't know if I can catch his name quickly because it came in at the end of the story but um, he was an incredible pianist in his own right 
and she had him accompany her, which also broke down all kinds of barriers. So one of the things that she would do is she would uh, sing arias and um, I can't think what that word is in opera. It's not a monologue, but it's where the main character would be singing Madame Butterfly. Madame a Butterfly would be singing her death scene. She did those kinds of <laughs> pieces from the opera, but then she would also do spirituals. Um, yeah, she really, she really was super, super incredible. And at a certain point, when she was in her older years, she eventually made it to uh, Verdi's opera in Mask Ball at uh, one of the opera houses that was banned to her. The Daughters of the American Republic had an orchestra, they called it Orchestra Hall, I believe. Oh, was that right? Constitution Hall, oh, now I'm getting mixed up. Anyhow, they said, no, she can't perform here. So her big moment, her biggest, biggest moment really was singing at the Lincoln Center in front of the steps there. Lincoln is behind, they brought out a piano and I'll just show you. She's up there all by herself, so singing with her accompanist because she could not get into this Constitution Hall that the Daughters of the American Republic refused entry to. So this was a protest and that audience is 100% integrated. People of all kinds of um, races and religions and colors and so on came to watch. It was a huge crowd. So good for her. So anyway, this was a Newberry nonfiction. First one that's, I could be lying about that. I think there might have been an earlier one that was nonfiction. Um, but it was one of the first nonfictions that were given out in um, in the Newberry Awards. I think there were a couple in the early years, quite a couple in the, there were a few in the early years, but then there was a long string of um, only fiction. And I think now, in the last five years or so, there's uh, more of a balance between fiction and nonfiction, but I don't have those lists in front of me. So one of the things I noticed in terms of this little four or five years of reading the Newberries is that uh, children encountering death. So where have I got this one, Kira Kira, where the, uh, the main protagonist's sister is passing away and Olive's Ocean where a classmate has passed away and we don't ever meet that girl. Both of these girls are coming to terms with um, death around them, grieving, processing and uh, both of these books just handled it so well. I did look up both of these authors and both of these authors have got nice whoops, uh, backlists if you're looking for something else to read. And so I guess that's it, Newberry Challenge completed. Next week I have a fun video. Cheryl and I are talking about um, my husband Simon, which is from one of the, uh, the British Women's Library reprints. And um, there's a dog in the background. <laughs> I won't surprise you. I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true and I'll see you in the month of July. Bye-bye.